Awesome. Thank you. The uh, got to hear her practicing the other day. That's fun to hear her play. Go ahead and take your Bibles, turn to the book of Jonah. We are finishing up the book of Jonah today, Jonah chapter 4. And so uh, I just want to review with you real quickly what we have already studied. What I've tried to do in this series is at the end of each message, kind of wrap up the chapter with one main kind of thought that helps us think through the book of Jonah. And I'll do the same thing today. And so I want to review those things real quickly. First of all, chapter 1, we learn that you can run from God, but you can't outrun God. We have all resisted His will, and we've all sometimes turned to our own way, but God's grace reaches further than we could ever run. Chapter 2, we learn that God's discipline is not to pay us back for our sin. God's not a vindictive God who's just waiting for us to step out of line so He can squash us like a bug. His discipline is to bring us back to Him. It is to bring us back into a proper relationship with Him. It is to change our perspective so that we can get to know Him once again. In chapter 3, we talked last week a little bit about revival. And the idea there is when we get on the same page as God, He will do what He has always wanted to do. That's what Jonah did. He finally got on the same page with God, and God did what He'd always wanted to do. God wanted to reach the Ninevites. God wanted them to hear the message of His salvation And finally, although he didn't do a great job of it, when Jonah did what God wanted him to do, God did exactly what he wanted to do. So, now we come to chapter 4. This is an interesting chapter. We see in this chapter Jonah getting very angry with God. Now, remember, we've said through this whole series that Jonah really is the story of all of us. Because we have all resisted God's will from time to time. There's not one of us among us who hasn't done that from time to time. And when we come to chapter 4, we see a very similar thing. We see Jonah getting angry with God, and when we look at his actions, we realize he is so much like us because we have all struggled from time to time with hypocrisy, have we not? We have all struggled from time to time with uncontrolled... Dan and Brenda are looking at each other going, not me, no, uh uh-uh. Well, I have, I'll just be honest with you. uh, I love it. You know, what's I love... One of the things I do appreciate about our church is, is typically you're very dialed into what I'm doing up here. And I see your faces, and sometimes they just tickle me. And so I just I appreciate that. They just made me laugh. They're just, not me. <laughs> um, but we all have from time to time. We've all, we've all struggled with uncontrolled anger. How many of you let your anger get out of control every once in a while? We all have, right? We've all, we've all struggled with being judgmental thinking that we're better than someone else for whatever reason. And even, I'll be honest with you, sometimes we've struggled with a hateful attitude toward those who aren't just like us. Sometimes we think, well, we're this way, so everybody should be this way, and we've struggled with it. Ben Franklin said this, and I think it's a powerful quote. He said, whatever is begun in anger ends in shame. Think about that for a minute. Whatever is begun in anger ends ends in shame. Let me give you an example from the world of sports. <clears throat> After a long drive for a hunting trip in a friend's farm, uh, Yankees legend Mickey Mantle decided he was going to play a joke on the coach, Billy Martin. And so they arrived, and, and the man actually asked Mickey Mantle to go and to shoot his old sick mule, which was dying, and he said, just put it out of its misery since you're here. And so, however, he decided to play a joke. He told Billy Martin that the friend had told him they couldn't hunt on his farm, And so he headed towards the barn, screaming, I'll show him, I'm going to shoot his prize mule. And he went into the barn and he shot the mule. And then, all of a sudden, he heard two more shots being fired. And Billy Martin shouted, that's right, we'll show him, I just shot two of his cows. Now here's the thing. Mickey Mantle's reputation for being angry and doing things in anger made Billy Martin think that he was capable of shooting this man's prize mule. That gives some meaning to the Bible verse in Proverbs that says, make no friendship with an angry man. It's true. And so the glimpse that we get in Jonah chapter 4 is this, it's really looking into the heart of Jonah and really any person who has resentment and anger towards God. And what happens is, just like happened to Jonah, when we're angry with God, we, we get upset 
we get we begin to unload on people and on God and and we absolutely become unreasonable and no one can talk to us and that's what happened with Jonah so I'm going to read Jonah chapter 4 and then we'll continue with our message Jonah chapter 4 says starting actually starting in remember chapter 3 verse 10 because remember the end of each verse of the chapter in Jonah leads into the next chapter so the Bible says speaking of the Ninevites when they repented when God saw what they did how they turned from their evil way God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Now here's the key to the whole book of Jonah, verse 2. For I knew that you are a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, re- abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. How many of you are glad that is the way God is? I sure am. Verse 3, Therefore, Jonah says, Now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better to me than die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? <clears throat> so Jonah went out of the city and sat at the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till, so, till he should see what should become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Now notice that. He's angry that God's doing what he wants to do, but he's gr- grateful because of the plant because it shaded him. But, verse 7, when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. <clears throat> when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, It is better for me to die than to live. <clears throat> but God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Could you just imagine? Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And then God says, And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? When I was a child... My mother would often say something like this to me. She would say, Joel, you're getting too big for your britches. And then she'd say, it's time for an AA. Now, she wasn't talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. She was talking about an attitude adjustment. Yes. How many of you, your parents, are like, okay, we won't talk about that. <clears throat> Reminds me of a story. Each afternoon, Grandpa took a nap. So one day, the kids decided to put Limburger cheese on his mustache. So he woke up and he thought, he just went, it stinks in here. And he walked into the kitchen and he said, stinks in here too. And so he walked outside for some fresh air. Of course, there was no relief because he didn't know that the cheese was there. And he said, the whole world stinks. And that's pretty much where Jonah was. To Jonah, because God didn't do what he wanted to do, the whole world stunk. And he needed an attitude adjustment from God. And so the question for us today is this. How does God give us an attitude adjustment? We all need it from time to time. First thing he does is, you can follow along in your outline if you like, he gives us challenging experiences. We see that in verses 1 through 3. Now, we might look at this story, and we might think, well, wait a minute. Wasn't Jonah's bad attitude because of the experience? In other words, wasn't it because of what happened that Jonah had a bad attitude? No, no, no. Please understand this. God saw what was already inside of Jonah, and he knew that he had an attitude problem. Many people have said this. They've said, and I think it's true, difficulties don't cause bad behavior. They reveal what's in our hearts. Let me say that again. Difficulties don't cause bad attitudes. They reveal them within our hearts. In fact, here's what Scripture says. The Lord does not look at things like man does. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. 
Now, how many of you would agree Jonah had a bad attitude? Yeah, he did. In fact, that's what the whole book is about. The whole thing's showing Jonah's attitude. And, and I thought about this. If Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet, I'd like to call Jonah the whining prophet. Because he, ju- he did. He just had a bad attitude. And, but the real problem was not the circumstances. The problem was in Jonah's heart. See, please understand this. That an attitude problem is a problem of the heart. God simply put Jonah in a place where the attitude was exposed. Now, I thought about this. <clears throat> I've never seen one of these up close, but how many of you know what a crucible is? Floyd, you probably know what one is, right? Floyd worked in a, in, in a, in a metal uh, shop for a long time. and A crucible was this refining pot that was used to separate the filth from the ore. They would put the, the steel, the metal in there, and the good ore would separate and fall to the bottom while the dirt and all the useless filth would rise up to the top where it could be scooped out. And that's kind of what life is like sometimes. Sometimes God lets us go through things to get all the junk out. Here's what Proverbs says. Take away the dross from the silver and the smith has material for a vessel. Now, let me ask you. What do doctors, detectives, and God have in common? You might think, I have no idea. They're all really interested in what's going on on the inside. Think about it for a minute. A doctor has to treat the cause, not just the symptoms. I mean, you go to the doctor and you say, well, here, I have a problem with this. And all you want him to do is to take care of this. But he's like, well, that's not really the problem. The problem is being caused by this. A, a police officer, a detective, gets to the heart of the matter, the motive the real culprit, what it was really all about, the M.O., if you will. And God exposes and deals with the real problems in our lives. He deals with the attitude issues. He deals with the sin in our lives. This, people say it this way, the reason why many people don't like to read the Bible is because the Bible reads them. It's because the Bible shows us what's really going on. And God wants to get to the heart of the matter. And, and that's what was going on with Jonah. Jonah had an attitude problem. He needed an attitude adjustment. So God let him go through this experience to expose this attitude so God could deal with it. And the truth is, God may do that in our lives. God may send us through the crucible. God may send us through a difficulty. God may challenge us because he wants to show our attitudes so he can change it. Now, let me ask you this. Would you agree that in this book of Jonah, you can see, the Bible says over and over, God prepared this fish, God prepared this wind, God prepared the sun, God prepared the, the, the plant, God prepared all these. Would you agree with me that behind the scenes, God was doing all of these things, even the fact that God saved the Ninevites? Would you agree that God was doing all those things behind the scenes? You know, I think we need to get to the point where we understand that God is far more concerned and involved and interested in our lives than we give him credit for. Instead of looking at difficulties as obstacles that we just have to figure out how to get around, I mean, sometimes we think like that. Okay, I have a problem. What can I do to solve it? How can I get out of this? How can I change something that it'll, that it'll go away? But instead of seeing it as an obstacle to get around, we need to see problems as opportunities for God to make us into the image of his son. God often sends difficulties and and incredible trials because He knows the attitudes of our hearts. And He wants us to be like Christ. He wants the world to see Christ through us. But that can't happen if our attitudes are wrong. So sometimes God sends challenging experiences. And they're tough. But God has a purpose behind it. So that's one of the ways God gives us an attitude adjustment. Secondly, God sometimes asks us challenging questions. You see that in verse 4 and verse 9. How many of you have children who are very curious, who ask questions over and over? They're always asking questions. If my mom was here, she'd probably raise both hands because I think I drove her nuts as a kid because I was like, what about this? Why is that? Why does that do that? What about sometimes my wife? I drive her nuts because I ask so many questions because I just want to know. But questions are great tools. They're great tools for learning. For instance, uh, many churches for many, many years have used the Westminster Shorter Catechism to teach children because it's a series of questions about God with an answer from Scripture. I, I've used often uh, what's called the Quest Study Bible, which is kind of, it asks questions to the text. 
and then kinds of it's a great way to learn through questions and answers. Pastor Joe actually is doing a, a series right now with our teenagers on on when God asks us questions. Well, two times in this text, God asked Jonah pretty much the same question. And the question is this what right do you have to be angry? What right do you have to be angry with me? What right do you have to be angry about the gourd? I mean, he asked some of these questions and you know, attitude change happens and it begins when we start asking ourselves questions like this do i really have a good reason to feel this way should i be thinking like this should i be acting like this in fact paul would say this he say if we would judge ourselves we would not come under judgment and that was listen if we would learn to be honest instead of just emotional Many times we would see that we shouldn't feel the way that we do. Sometimes we have to just step back from the situation and realize, okay, what's going on here? Because emotion is a wonderful gift from God, but if you don't know it, emotion can get you in a lot of trouble too. And sometimes we've got to step back and just be honest about a situation. Instead of just feeling things about it, sometimes we need to really ask specific questions and we need to be honest about it. That was the case with Job. I, I love the story of Job. Job 38, 4, God says, Well, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. God asked Job. Job had gone through this incredible suffering, worse than any of us have ever experienced. And God asked him a series of 83 questions. And Job could not answer one of them. And here's what God was doing. He was driving home the point, Job, you've got to let me be God and not you. You've got to let me be the one who is the creator, who is the sovereign, who answers to no one, Job. You can't be God. I am. And that was the case with Jonah here in verses 4 and 9. Remember, this was God's prophet who, whose preaching led to the greatest revival in history. I mean, he gives this, again, an eight-word sermon in English, a five-word sermon in Hebrew. He gives this sermon and the entire town just turns to faith in god it's an incredible thing and what was his response i mean sometimes i have i have preachers who come in and speak for different reasons and or even when i was in a in youth group they say well what do you want me to do what do you want me to speak about what do you expect what's kind of going on i said well when you preach for me here's what i expect i expect every person in the church to get saved sanctified filled with the holy spirit called to the mission field and give all their money but you know no no expectations no pressure you know um I mean, here, could you imagine? He walks through town and does this simple, and, and people just turn to God. And what's his response? He's angry. See, he couldn't see the big picture. He couldn't see what God was really trying to do. And here's what I find. I was talking with Dan about this this week, and I was talking about both these cases. And he just, great point. In both these cases, and with Job and with Jonah, you know what I find interesting? God gets the last word. And he always does, and he always will. Because he's God, and we're not. He's sovereign. We are not. <clears throat> when difficulties come, there's some things we can do. And Daniel Defoe wrote the book, Robinson Crusoe. And the first thing, if you know the story that Robin Crusoe did when he got on the island, is he was make out a list. And he began to list all of his problems on one side, and on the other side he began to list all of his blessings. And so what he found is that when he would write, okay, I have no clothes, he would write on the other side, well, it's warm weather. I have no food, I have no provisions, but everywhere I go there's fresh water and fresh fruit and fish to catch. And, and, and he went down that list, and what he realized was that for every negative aspect about his life, there was a positive aspect, there was something to be thankful for. And when we really think about all that God has done, we have so much to be thankful for. And when we find ourselves kind of on an island of despair, if you will, take inventory of our blessings. God has blessed us. And so I asked the question to myself, as well as to us, that God asked Job, or God asked Jonah, what right do we have to be angry with God? What right do we have to be angry with God? The answer is none. Now, please understand this. I'm in no way minimizing people's pain and suffering. If you know me, you know that when people hurt, I hurt. And it bothers me and it 
It really bothers me when I feel like I can't help someone. And I'm not saying that it's a sin to ask God why things are the way they are. Because that's just being human. Read your Psalms. David asked a whole lot of questions. However, what I do find is this. We always seem to think that we are the exception to the rule. I mean, there's very few of us, if we were counseling someone else, we would counsel them not to be angry with God. We'd say, look at all the things God does. Don't be angry with Him because He's done all these wonderful things. And yet, we often seem to think when it's our trouble, we have a right to be angry with God because you don't know how much I'm suffering. And again, I say, we really don't have that right. You see, remember in chapter 2 we said this. When life is hardest, which let's be honest, life is hard. I mean, there are people in this church right now that I talk to and I know they, they got difficulties. They have heartbreaking things they're walking through in their life. And yet, we always have one thing we can be thankful for. Anybody remember what it is? What is it, buddy? God. Salvation in Christ. Absolutely, buddy. And I'm not making light of people's pain and agony. Please understand. But we must remember that God does... We have to remember what God did to bring us to Himself. Think about... I want to show you some scriptures. Think about this. Psalm 68, 19. I'll put it on the screen. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ redeemed us. That word redeem is the language of the marketplace. It means that He purchased, the word redeem means to purchase something at an extremely high price. And that's what Jesus did. He paid the price for our sin so that we might be his possession. And when life is hard, we need to remember all that God has done for us. You know what? I, I do. In my heart of hearts, I wish I, I wish I had a magic wand where all those that are suffering, I could just go, no more suffering. Wouldn't it be nice if the gospel really was, hey, come to Jesus, all your problems go away. We couldn't keep the doors. I mean, it'd be unbelievable. But that's not the case. Life is tough. But in the midst of it all, we can rejoice in God who loves us and gave himself for us. So sometimes God puts us in challenging experiences. Sometimes God asks us challenging questions. And lastly, sometimes he teaches us challenging lessons. God is so gracious, isn't he? Don't you agree? And so God provides this plant for Jonah to give him some shade and some comfort. And even though Jonah was being so selfish, God still gave him something to comfort him. And, and it may have been some type of palm tree, we don't really know. But ultimately, here's why God was doing what he was doing. God provides this plant to comfort him temporarily, but ultimately to teach Jonah just how foolish he had been acting. I mean, only a fool would have more concern for a plant than the souls of people. God cares for the people of the world, and Jonah only cared for himself. And so the lesson for us is simply this. It's not fun to be put in your place by God, but we're always better off for it. It was not fun when my mom came to me and said, boy, you need an attitude adjustment. But I was better for it because I did need it. Here's what Proverbs says. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Listen to this verse. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Profuse are the kisses of an enemy. Let me just spend a minute here. So if Tim and I are friends, which we're not. I don't even like Tim. No, I'm just kidding. I love Tim. <laughs> so if Tim and I are friends, that means that sometimes Tim may have to wound me. You say, what's he going to do, slap you? Well, I might need it. He might need to slap me. But what it means is sometimes he's going to speak truth into my life that I need to hear even though it's hard. And you know what? Hopefully, I will grow because of it. Be aware of those people who just always flatter you. Open rebuke is better than secret love. <clears throat> There's one, uh, uh, one of his assignments when he was a young infantry officer, Colin Powell, you probably heard that name before. 
He was assigned to guard a 280-millimeter atomic cannon. He alerted his men. He loaded his 45 caliber revolver. He jumped in his Jeep, but he soon realized that the gun that he had just loaded was gone. And so he radioed his captain to tell him the situation. Of course, the captain was incredibly upset, um, but told him to continue the mission. So later, his captain handed him his gun, and he told him that a young boy had found it. But thankfully, he had only gotten off one shot before it was recovered. And then he yelled at the top of his voice, Don't ever let it happen again. But when he checked his weapon, he found that the magazine was full and it had not been fired. The captain had made up the story to prove a point, to teach him a lesson. And Colin Powell would say, His example of intelligent leadership was not lost on me. He allowed me to learn from my mistake. Now, you know, God would never fabricate a story to teach us a lesson. God is a God of truth and honesty and integrity. But God always disciplines us for his good, our good. Remember, we said that God's discipline is not to pay us back for our sins, but to bring us back to himself. As John 15, 2 says, that every branch that does bear fruit in Christ, God prunes that they might bear more fruit. So God prepared this plant, this worm, this east wind, not to make Jonah feel guilty, but to change his attitudes towards God. And sometimes God has to teach us valuable lessons to change your attitude. Now, let me wrap this up this way. <clears throat> I have to admit this. I'll just, this is confession time. Um, I got this from Pinterest. I know that's terrible. I'm a guy and I shouldn't be on Pinterest. <laughs> but when I, when I looked it up, it came up on Pinterest and I clicked into it. It was terrible. You can fire me if you want. I mean, but it's on Pinterest. So, it's just true. Uh, but they say if you take three pots of boiling hot water, and if you put into one of them potatoes, and into one of them eggs, and one of them coffee beans, you get three very different results. Of course, the potatoes go in there hard. They're strong. They put them in, and they come out soft and weak. You know, you've had mashed potatoes. How many of you love mashed potatoes? Oh, I love mashed potatoes. The eggs, of course, go in. They're fragile. You've got to be careful. You, know, you don't want to break them. You put them in there. They go in the boiling water, and it hardens them up on the inside, and they become hard-boiled eggs, which I also love. However, the coffee beans, when they put in to the boiling water, they're unique because when they're exposed to the boiling water, they change, and they create something new and wonderful something that Dan has in his hand right now. Coffee. <laughs> He's hiding. So I got to thinking about this. So I'm talking about potatoes and eggs and coffee, and I'm like, man, now I want breakfast. But the question is this. In dealing with difficult situations, which are you? Are you a potato? Are you an egg? Are you the coffee beans? Now I'm going to come back to that in just a minute, so bear with me. But first, here's the application for this story. Here's the... Really, this is the main point of chapter 4, but this is really the only, also the main point of the entire book. In life, things happen around us. And things happen to us. But what matters most is what we let God do inside of us. See, Jonah couldn't help that the Ninevites were so wicked and that they hated the Israelites and they treated them so badly. He also couldn't help the fact that God wanted to save the city of Nineveh. He, he couldn't control the storm. He couldn't control the great whale. He couldn't even control the plant that grew up. However, what he could do is he could allow God to work in his life to change him and to give him a new heart. Now, the question is, did he? We really don't know. Jonah's interesting. Jonah is one of only two books in Scripture that end in a question. The other book is Nahum, which interestingly enough also deals with the city of Nineveh. But it's like God asked the question and he left. He just walked out of the room. You ever have someone just do that? They drop a bomb on you, they, pfft, they leave. It's like, what? He asked this question. and So, so the question is, did, did Jonah repent? Some think he must have, or he wouldn't have written the book. Another way of thinking of it is some people think he may not have repented, but God made him write the book against his will, just like he did everything else with Jonah. We don't really know. We don't really know. But here's, here's, here's the clincher. And by the way, so God leaves this book in a cliffhanger. Don't you hate that when you watch a TV show and it's left in the cliffhanger? You're like, ah, what happened? 
especially when it's the end of a season. He leaves this book in a cliffhanger. But the real question is not, did Jonah repent? The real question for you and for me today is this. Have we repented? Have we repented? See, if you're here today without Christ, and you've not repented of your sins, you've not turned from your sins to God in faith, today you can turn for mercy to God and invite Christ into your life. You can do it today. But if you're a believer... Have we repented of our bad attitudes? Our ingratitude for God's grace on others? You see, the question is, are you like a potato? Have you allowed the circumstances of life to mash you up and to destroy your resolve? Have you given up? Christ can restore that resolve to you that you've lost and give you the courage to stand for Him and to live for Him. Are you like the egg? And you've allowed life to harden you. And you no longer are sensitive to God and to others. God can take the heart of stone out of us. And He can build within us a heart of flesh if we'll turn to Him so that we can be sensitive to Him and others. Or will you be like the coffee bean and allow God to change you completely. My encouragement to you is this. Don't let your life be a cliffhanger where everybody wonders, do they know Christ? Are they right with God? My encouragement is to get right with God today. Let me have your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'm going to do something today that I don't normally do. I don't do it very often. But I really felt like in wrapping up this book and the themes that it dealt with, it was an appropriate thing to do. I'm going to give an invitation. What I mean by that is this. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I'm going to have several of our leaders up here up front And you can grab one of them and say, you know, I'm not sure I know Christ today. I don't know if I know him, but would you help me know Christ? Would you show me in the Bible how I can know Christ? Or maybe you do know Jesus, but hey, we're just honest. There's some coldness. There's some hardness in our hearts. Maybe you're running from God in certain areas. Maybe you know someone who's running from God. But I'd also like to give you an opportunity to come and to right up front pray. Whether it's asking God to soften your heart or someone else's. If you'd like someone to pray with you, there will be leaders up here to pray with. But this is going to be an opportunity for you and for me to do business with God today. Again, I don't normally do this. But I would like for you to, if God is speaking to your hearts, I would like for you to step out of your seat and come, make an altar right here. Say, God, I want you to work on the hardness of my heart. And so with heads bowed and eyes closed, if the men I've spoken to would just come and stand at the front, I'm going to pray. And when I finish praying, if God is speaking to your heart for any reason, I invite you to come. If you'd like to pray here, if you'd like someone to pray with you, if you'd like to know more about Christ and how you can know Him, I invite you to come today. Listen to the Holy Spirit and what He's speaking to your life. God, I know what we're doing here today is unusual. But Lord, I know that you do speak to us. And God, many times when we don't have an opportunity to respond, we, we, like a man who looks in a mirror, we walk away unchanged. So God, I, I just pray for us today. 
Lord, we're the only ones here, us and you. I know we don't do this to impress anybody, but God has an opportunity to do business with God. As an opportunity to pray for that loved one who's far away, who's run away. As an opportunity to bring our own hearts before you. As an opportunity to receive Christ. I pray, God, we would respond to what your Holy Spirit is speaking. And you'd move. And we thank you in Christ's name. Amen. With your heads bowed and eyes closed, if you would like to step forward now as your opportunity to do that, you can be a child, an adult, it doesn't matter. But if God is speaking to your heart, this is an opportunity for you to come.